reading through the Bible in one year, February 3rd, Genesis 35 through 36. That's right, two chapters of Genesis today. Buckle up. Mark chapter 6, uh, Job 2, there we go, and Romans 6. I'm skipping over Job. I feel bad. It's a good book. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away all the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which um, which they had uh, in the rings that were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which is near Shechem. As he journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities um, which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried below Bethel under the oak, and it was named Alan Bakuth. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, which remember means trickster. But Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. Okay. Um... I thought we had an, um, eh, well, whatever. I'll just go on. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come, from, come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place from where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured out oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel and went, rather, and when there was a still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow. Benjamin means son of the right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is, the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. It came about when Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now, um... Yeah, I guess I guess there's probably going to be new people here who haven't gone through this with me before. So when you want to establish yourself as someone who is taking over for someone who's over you, right? If, if you were um, orchestrating a coup and you were going to take over for the king who lived there, you would go in and sleep with the king's wife, typically where everybody could see it. If not his wife, then his concubines. You would sleep with somebody that he was sleeping with to show that you now have the authority over those things and over his household. That's how it was. So when this happened, it may well be that he fell in love with her and they had you know great romance, whatever else. The fact of the matter was, in the eyes of the rest of the world around them, he was usurping his father's rule over him. He was, even though he is the eldest. He was um, still 
It's like he was jumping the gun and forcing his hand with it. Uh, the same way that um, Esau expected to take over for Jacob. Sorry, take over in place of Jacob. Now, there were 12 sons of Jacob, sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the son of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. Jacob came to his father at Isaac, rather, Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age, and his sons Esau and Jacob. Now, no longer in enmity with, at enmity with one another, buried him. Now, these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of the Elon the Hittite, and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna, the, and the granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, also Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth, Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, Basemath bore Reuel, and Oholabama bore Jeush, Jelam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all his goods which he had acquired in the land of Canaan and went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For their property had become too great for them to live together. And the land where they'd sojourned uh, could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. Remember this later. Whenever we hear about the Edomites and what they're doing to the people of Israel, remember that they are of the same lineage as the Jews. These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah, Ruel, uh, Reuel, there we go, uh, the son of Esau's wife, Basemath. The two, rather, the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timna, I lost my spot. Aha, T uh, Timna was a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek, of the Amalekites, to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Adah. These are the sons of Reuel, or Reuel, Nahath and Zerah, Shammah and Mizah. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Basemath. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Oholabama. Sorry, yeah, Oholabama. The daughter of Anah and the granddaughter of Zibion. She bore to Esau, Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, Chief Timan, Chief Omar, Chief Zepho, Chief Kinez, Chief Korah, Chief Gatam, Chief Amalek. These are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Reuel, Esau's son, Chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Sama, Chief Mizah. These are the chiefs descended from Reuel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Besamath. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Aholabama, Chief Jeush, Chief Jalam, Chief Korah. These are the chiefs descended from Esau's wife, Aholabama, the daughter of Anah. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, and Anah, and Dishan, and Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Horai and Himam, and Lotan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, Manahath, and Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion. I, how do you pronounce it? A-I-A-H. I'm guessing. And Anah. 
and he is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zibion. These are the sons of Anna, Dishon and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Karen. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, and Zeavan, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishon, Uz, and Aran. These are the sons descended from the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anna, Chief Dishon, Chief Ezer, Chief Dishon. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, according to their various chiefs in the land of Seir. Now, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom, before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinaba. Yeah, that's right, Dinhaba. Then Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, became king in his place. Then Jobab died, and Husham the, uh, of the land of the Temanites became king in his place. Then Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Badad, who defeated Midian in the land of Moab, became king in his place, and the name of his city was Avith. Then Hadad died, and Samla of Mascara became king in his place. Then Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth of the on the Euphrates River became a king in his place. Then Shaul died, and um, Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, became king in his place. Then Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar became king in his place. And the name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mah- uh, sorry, Mezahab. Now, these are the names of the chiefs descended from Esau, according to their families and their, local, and their localities, by their names. Chief Timna, Chief Alva, Chief Jethath, Chief Aholabama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinon, Chief Kenaz, Chief Taman, Chief Miz, uh, Mibzar, Chief Magdiel, Chief Imram. Sorry, Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. Now, here we are in Mark chapter 6. Jesus went out from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the disciples came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these, te- get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as performed by his, uh, yeah, by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals and, he added, Do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter your house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off of the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. Then they went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and anointing many with oil, or rather, anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. But King Herod heard of it, for his name had become well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying, he is Elijah. And others were saying, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. For Herod himself had sent, and, and John, rather had John arrested, and bound him on bound him in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. 
For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to be put to death, but could not do so, for Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. A strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask for me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you, up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? She said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. I mean, he had promised, right? Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head, and he went and had him beheaded in the prison. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in a tomb. And when his disciples, this is John the Baptist, heard about it, the apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, that this is now a second thing. This, this isn't the same disciples and apostles. They're, they're different people. And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. Now, the people saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This this place is desolate, and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, You give them something to eat. I said to him, Shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go, look. And they, uh, when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. I suppose that's better than bluegrass. And they sat down in groups of, of hundreds and of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up twelve full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. There were five thousand men, that's beside women and children, who ate of the loaves. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was the evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that he was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained any insight from the um, incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. When they had Crossed over, they came to uh, land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there on, on their pallets those who were sick to the place where they heard he was. Wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that he might just touch the fringe of his cloak 
or that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were being cured. Yeah, this is going to be a long one anyway. Uh, so one of the things you notice from the very beginning, he couldn't do anything in his own town because they didn't have faith in him. He's not going to do the work for people who don't have faith. So um, as we see here, the, the, the faith that people had, they believed so much in what Jesus could do that they believed that even if they just touched the fringe of his garment, he didn't even have to do anything, just walk by, and that's all that would be necessary. And they were, see, sorry, they were healed. And Jesus had done this before for other people. Remember when he was talking to the woman who had the blood who dried up, and he said, your faith has made you well? This is exactly that. So the thing to note here is it's, it's not that Jesus is limited, right? Like, there's some sort of power he has to derive from the people to do these things. It's that he's not going to do the work for them if they don't believe he can do the work. There's no point to it. All right, let's go on. Job chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From rowing about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Jacob. Why did I say Jacob? Smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot shard to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. That's not a great wife. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity uh, that had come upon him, they came, each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and to comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe, and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. And only if they had just kept quiet. But we'll get to that. Romans chapter 6. Paul continues. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. We have died to our sins. They no longer have any control over us. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. 
Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not united under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are no longer under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to, to, to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one to whom, rather, of the one whom you obey? Either slaves of sin, resulting in death, or slaves of obedience, resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as, members being body parts, um, as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, res resulting in further lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't have to follow it. You couldn't follow it. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? What was the benefit that you got out of living your life free to sin however you wanted? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, is death. but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Go ahead and pull up all the notes here, because there's quite a few. There we go. And that's all of them. All right. So, uh, sweet. We, uh, yeah. We're going to go through one of the chapters of Romans that I quote pretty much most often. This one in Romans 14 and 9 are the three chapters I typically quote a lot, but we'll get to that tomorrow. So behold, the word of the Lord. <laughs>